I've oh thank you very much um uh, I've known for a while Richard I think you did your PhD in computer science with us didn't you at UEA I did yeah and I think what you were working with uh Scott Grandison and Vincent Moulton if I remember rightly good, good memory yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it wasn't that good a memory. I quickly stopped to reread your thesis, which is available online, and as you would expect, very careful and well done. And you've continued that stellar career by uh, moving across the research park where you work at the Erlen Institute, uh, which I know you'll say a little bit about in your talk. So, Richard, um, thanks very much for doing this. I know it's a hassle to prepare a talk, um, but I'm grateful. And I'm very much looking forward to it. So I'm just going to mute myself and uh, give give the floor to you. Okay, thanks very much. I'll, I'll share my slides. Uh, hope, oh, hang on. Am I, am I, no, I'm sharing the wrong slide. Hang on. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Let me try again. Um, uh, that one. Oh, hang on. Sorry about this. I should be able to handle the computer by now. But for some reason, it's never smooth. Right, let's try again. Right. Ah, Richard, just to inter intervene, I've forgotten that we are streaming this on YouTube, so I can't see all the attendees. So okay. uh, don't feel too panicked if you see an, a measly 11 in the <laughs> audience. Okay, no worries. There are others lurking. No worries. You can see my uh, slides now, can you? I can, yes. And they Excellent. look very nice. Excellent. Thanks very much. Yeah, well, thanks for that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, Richard. Um, so, um, yeah, very briefly then about the Erlen Institute, where I'm, I'm now based. So, um, we're a, a biosciences institute funded by uh, the, the BBSRC. Um, you can see in this top picture here, this, this red building is the Erlen Institute, and then behind that is the John Innes Centre. And then uh, there's a field, and then beyond the field is the is the UEA, uh, where Richard's based. Um, so, we're part of the Norwich Research Park, a big um, area, area of uh, with lots of researchers. Um, we're focused particularly on uh, sequencing technology. Uh, so you can see our, our room full of sequences here. And we've also got um, a big emphasis on bioinformatics. So we've got some uh, quite extensive um, high performance computing facilities, including some really large memory machines, such as the, the SGI machines shown here. Um, I uh, I look after, um, I'm a group leader, I look after a group called the Technology Algorithms Group, and we're a group focused on developing uh, new methods and tools. So I come from a, a computational background originally, um, but we also have wet lab expertise in the group, so we develop uh, wet lab uh, methods and, and computational tools. And we've got a particular focus on, on real-time uh, sequence analysis and, and uh, in situ or, or in field um, uh, metagenomics, and I'll, I'll explain a bit more about what that means. Um, and you can see here some some pictures from some of our sort of infield activities, just to sort of set the scene. Um, but what I was planning to talk about then today is, um, so I know there's a, a, a there's quite a diverse uh, audience here. So uh, I was going to briefly introduce nanopore sequencing and what what metagenomics is, um, and then talk about a bit more about some of these these infield and, and in situ um, sequencing applications. Um, but the bulk of, of what I'm going to talk about today is about our project uh, called AirSeq, which is um, a project for, for sequencing the air, essentially, and, and looking for pathogens in the air. And, and that will kind of it, uh, combine um, a number of these topics, really, about uh, infield sequencing and real-time analysis and also automation. So uh, first of all, then, a quick introduction to, to nanopore sequencing and metagenomics. Uh, so very, very briefly, then uh, sequencing then is the, the process of determining the, the nucleotide sequence of, of DNA, or the, the letters of, of DNA. Um, and uh, you can see this sort of cartoon at the bottom here, um, basically showing what we're trying to do with sequencing. So we have a, uh, we have a species or, or set of species, uh, animals, bacteria, viruses, whatever. Um, and then to sequence the DNA, we have to break open the cells, um, get the DNA out of it and prepare it for, for sequencing. You can't put the DNA straight into a sequence, so you have to um, prepare it. Uh, and then um, the sequencer will then read the DNA effectively and generate what we call reads. And, and at the moment, we can't sequence a complete genome, 
um, we can only sequence parts of genomes and, and what, what the sequencer produces is these reads and we have short read sequences that produce um, reads that might be a, a few hundred nucleotides long or we have long read sequences that might produce um, reads that are thousands of, of nucleotides wrong. Um, oh, sorry, long. <laughs> Hopefully, not wrong. Um, and uh, and then this is uh, this is then what we we uh, we analyze with with bioinformatics these uh, uh, these these sequences of uh, these nucleotide sequences from sequencing. So that was your very brief overview to sequencing. Uh, I mentioned, or I said, in fact, I, on the first slide that we're particularly interested in metagenomics. And so, whereas genomics is the study of a of a single organism's genome, metagenomics is the study of, of DNA in, uh, in, in mixed samples, so multiple uh, species uh, mixed together. And so these are often um, uh, cl clinical or environmental samples. Um, so there are some examples are shown here, so like the soil on the left-hand uh, side, um, something we, we do a bit of analysis of, and, and you uh, extract DNA from soil and, and look at the uh, the community of, of microbes uh, in the soil um, and that's got lots of applications for example in, in agriculture uh, the middle image is um, a phd student called ned peel who's collecting some water from the river Yare, and we had a project where we were uh, looking at um, the microbial communities in in rivers around the world um, and and this was uh, one of the, the sampling uh, days for that uh, so that's another example of a metagenomic sample. And then on the right hand side, we've got a, a sort of cartoon of a, of a gut microbiome. And, um, and this is another area where, um, where we might use metagenomics to study the, the community of, of um, microbes inside the gut. And, uh, and again, we've had projects in this area where we've been looking to use sequencing for, for pathogen diagnostics. So that's uh, metagenomics. Um, we're particularly interested in nanopore sequencing uh, in, my, in my group, and this is a relatively new uh, sequencing technology um, introduced by Oxford Nanopore Technologies. And, and the first early access um, nanopore sequencer, the MinIron, was uh, was released in 2014, and we were um, lucky to be part of the the early access group for that. And um, a slightly newer version of it is shown here. So this is um, this is what it looks like. It's a very compact sequencer that um, plugs into the USB port of a laptop. Um, and this technology really has been revolutionary. Um, and some of the reasons why are shown on this slide. So um, one thing is the, the enormous um, size and cost reduction. So that top left picture there um, shows me in, inside one of EI's labs um, uh, about a year after the, the um, first Minon came out. And I'm standing next to what, were, what was at the time the state-of-the-art PacBio RS2 sequencer, the one on the left-hand side, the, the great big machine. And then I'm holding in my hand this nanopore sequencer, the Minon. And uh, there's some differences between the technologies, but in many ways, they produce similar kinds of data. Um, yet the PacBio is this massive machine costing hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, and the Minon is the, this tiny thing that... Um, uh, Oxford Nanopore don't charge for, they just charge for the, for the reagents. Um, and so really this has kind of led to a democratization of sequencing. So it's become possible for, uh, for sort of any, uh, any researcher really to do sequencing rather than only big sequencing centers. Um, and it's also meant that we can think about taking the lab out to the sample rather than having to bring the sample into the lab. And the, the sort of most extreme version of this is probably shown in the right-hand side um, picture at the top right. And this is a, a an astronaut on board the International Space Station um, carrying out nanopore sequencing in zero gravity. And that's a nanopore sequencer you can see at the, at the bottom right of that image. Um, and, you know, just the idea of sending up uh, one of those packed bio sequences up to the uh, up on a rocket to the space station uh, doesn't really bear thinking about. But um, something compact like the, the, the min iron can be taken anywhere. And then another really crucial thing about it um, is that it's got a, a the potential for real-time analysis. So every other sequencing platform requires um, you to prepare your DNA for sequencing and then to put it in the machine and then leave the machine sequencing. And at the end of a period, and it can be days, um, you can then uh, get your data off the, the instrument and start analyzing it. With nanopore sequencing, um, reads become available immediately you start sequencing. So uh, individual molecules are sequenced uh, and then the read 
uh, becomes available and then another molecule gets sequenced. So the reads come off it progressively and you can start analyzing progressively as well. And this is really critical for, um, for, for applications that depend on speed. And then finally, uh, the bottom right, the technology has undergone really rapid change since uh, 2014. So it started off with quite a high error rate. That's now come down enormously. Um, and the yield from it was relatively low, um, relatively small numbers of, of reads. Uh, but now um, you get massively more data. And this, this plot is showing uh, probably about the first uh, three or four years of development on of, of the uh, Minon and how the, the, the yield of data from it has increased uh, enormously in that time. Uh, so very briefly how nanopore sequencing works. I've got here a little video from, um, from Oxford Nanopore that I'm going to play and, and talk over. Um, and I might pause it a couple of times. So, um, so here's the Minon. Um, and then in it is this flow cell. This is the consumable that you buy from Oxford Nanopore, and it, it lasts for about 48 hours or 72 hours of sequencing. And then inside the flow cell, you, you load on your DNA molecules. Um, and basically, you have to prepare your, your DNA molecules um, using kits provided by Oxford Nanopore. And what, what those kits do is they, they attach a, a sequencing adapter uh, to the ends of the DNA, which contains uh, a motor protein. And then um, oh, hang on, I've gone back to the start. Clicked in the wrong place. Sorry about that. So uh, we were about here. Um, so here we go. We're loading the, the DNA again. Um, and then on the, uh, on, on the nanopore flow cell is an array of, uh, of nanopores. Uh, there's 2,048 of them um, arranged in, into groups of four. And then what happens is your molecules, uh, your DNA molecules, um, find their way to the nanopores and there's a tether on the surface that, that helps that and the motor protein docks with the nanopore and then the DNA uh, ends up getting uh, passed through the um, through the nanopore and there's a the nanopores in a, um, a resistant membrane and there's a potential across the membrane and as the uh, as the molecule goes through there's a, a, a deflection in the uh, in the electrical current um, and you get a, a characteristic signal um, which relates to the uh, DNA molecule going through it. And this is a, seeing this again. And if I uh, skip forward at this point to the next slide, um, this is just showing some of the, 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 the same concepts slightly differently. Um, so again, this, this image, we have, we have this membrane in which this biological nanopore is. Um, this molecule comes along with the motor protein. It docks with the nanopore. The uh, DNA molecule goes through the pore and there's uh, an electrical signal generated as it goes through. And then there's a process called base calling where that electrical signal is turned into um, a sequence of, um, of nucleotides. Um, and this is done with a, um, a neural network. Um, and it's, uh, it's uh, uh, usually done with a, a GPU uh, implementation. Um, and it's quite a, a, quite a com computationally complex um, operation that happens, um, uh, but anyway, at the end of the process, we get um, we get our DNA sequence out. So uh, Oxford and Nanopore ha now have a have a range of platforms, um, and and I mentioned this Minion, um, the original Minion, which is now called the Mark One B, um, which where you plug it into a laptop and the laptop carries out the base calling. They also have something called a Mark 1C, which is uh, essentially the same sequencer, but with its own compute. So it's got a touch screen um, and some built-in compute to carry out the base calling on, on the device. And then they have something called the Gridiron, which is essentially five flow cells on one device with a whole bunch of compute in the bottom. And then they have the, the biggest machine of all, the Prometheum, which takes flow cells that are five times the have five times the number of nanopores as the uh, the Minarm one, um, and it can also take forty eight of those. So you can generate enormous amounts of data from the Prometheum, but it requires this big server um, next to it to carry out the base calling. So that's the sort of broadly speaking the current range. But there's a couple of products that are on their way, which are quite interesting and worth worth mentioning. The Mark One D is the replacement for the Mark One C, and it basically gets rid of rid of the built in compute and uses an iPad instead. So it's basically a cradle for sequencing that connects to an iPad. And then um, it makes use of uh, the Apple Silicon on the iPad for carrying out the, the base calling. 
And then finally, the smidge on is a concept they've shown for a couple of years, but not yet released, um, which is a tiny little sequencer that attaches to a mobile phone. So really, I hope you can see this technology has been really, um, yeah, it's really changed sequencing from when it used to be, uh, you know, big machines uh, in, in a lab uh, to now these very portable devices. Now, we still have those big machines sitting in the labs at EI, and, uh, and in fact, they're, they're used um, you know, there's a lot more data generated on those than there is at the moment on the, on our uh, nanopore sequencers. But really, what nanopore sequencing has enabled is um, completely new applications of sequencing. And so, one key area is uh, is in field sequencing. And so, uh, in the next section, I'm just going to uh, show you a, a few ways in which we've used nanopore sequencing in field. Um, and uh, this is relatively light on results. It's more of a, a little slideshow for a, for a few slides just to show you what's possible with the technology. Um, so the first example um, is a field trip I took to Iceland with uh, Sarah Stewart Johnson, who's a, a planetary biologist at Georgetown University. And she's interested in the potential to use sequencing in space missions. Um, uh, and and so we went to Iceland because it's a, it's a well-established uh, Martian analog used by researchers, and it has some pretty extreme um, conditions and some extreme microbiomes that we wanted to uh, to look at. And so this is just a short video. This is us driving to the sampling site, so you can kind of see the kind of terrain. And um, this is what it looked like: these this sort of mountainous volcanic landscape with um, all kinds of steam coming out of vents in the ground and there's a couple of intrepid uh, members of the team here who are going down to sample in that video and you can see these pools of, um, of steam and uh, bubbling liquid um, and we went here to, to sample from um, for, from these uh, these areas where there's um, pretty extreme uh, microbes that survive in these conditions um, and the aim of the, the trip was to explore these, these in-field approaches. So we, we carried out everything um, from DNA extraction through to analysis uh, in-field using just a car battery for power. So you can see in the middle picture, there's uh, some DNA extraction going on. Um, on in the right-hand picture, um, one of the teams loading the, the Minan sequencer. Um, and, and on the left hand side, you can see we had a couple of laptops, one which we use for, for sequencing and base calling, and then it was networked to the second one, which was being used for uh, analysis. And so again, this is just another view of the sequencing on the left hand side and the, the analysis on the right hand side. Um, and we used uh, a similar approach or rather uh, PhD student Emma Langham did um, for a project we call ShipSeq, where she's been away with the British Antarctic Survey. Um, carrying out in situ uh, sequencing uh, and analysis on board this research vessel, the Discovery. And this is really exciting because uh, currently doing this kind of um, research in, in, in these sort of faraway um, environments is, is really tricky. And, and conventionally samples, you could gather samples on a, on a research cruise, and then it would take months and months and months to get those samples back to a lab. It um, can take nine months. Uh, six to nine months typically to get them back from the Antarctic. Um, and what you're able to do if you can sequence uh, in situ is you can uh, actually vary uh, where you go and sample as a result of what you find. Um, and, and you've also overcome these issues with, with uh, transport of samples and, and the degradation of samples that can happen um, along, uh, during that process. And so Emma uh, went on board this cruise. You can see here some pictures. This is uh, uh, the device that was used for sampling uh, water along the way. And then there was a small lab on board the boat that Emma was able to carry out DNA extractions in and then uh, carry out sequencing. Here she is loading the Minan sequencer. And then here again, you can see a similar setup to, to what we had in, in Iceland with a, a sequencing laptop and a, an analysis laptop with, with real-time analysis. And we'll talk a bit more about the real-time analysis a bit later. Emma, um, unfortunately, uh, she was due to go on another cruise, but COVID got in the way, unfortunately. So we ended up um, doing peer seek instead. So instead of sequencing in the Antarctic, we studied uh, uh, phytoplankton in the, uh, around the coast of, of Norfolk instead. Um, and this is uh, the end of Cromer Pier, uh, where again, we, we set up everything needed to, to go 
to do sample collection through to analysis powered from this, this battery here, you can see here. So uh, there's a, a battery here powering um, a couple of those Mark 1C uh, minions and the analysis laptop. So in this case, the, the minion is carrying out the base calling and then the data is being sent over a network to this laptop where analysis is being carried out. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what's possible with uh, nanopore sequencing and in-field sequencing. And then, um, as I say, the rest of the uh, talk, I'm going to talk about our project AirSeq, which sort of brings together, make, makes use of some of these um, aspects of nanopore sequencing that, um, uh, that really are, are kind of revolutionary, the, the in-field aspects, the real-time aspects. And we'll talk a bit about automation as well. Uh, so AirSeq is our method for uh, sequencing the uh, biological material in the air um, and it's a collaboration with a guy called uh, Matt Clark who was uh, used to be at the LM Institute and is now at the Natural History Museum so we're working with the Natural History Museum on, on this as we go forward um, and the original vision that Matt and I had for AirSeq was um, as a uh, as a sensor that could sit in a in a field of crops and monitor the air for crop pathogens um, and, and could alert um, you know, via a mobile phone or something, a, a farmer or agronomist to, to let them know when uh, levels of pathogens are, are reaching uh, threshold levels or perhaps when new, new pathogens have been identified. Um, and then also, we, you know, the, the potential to monitor the evolution of pathogens as well and to, um, uh, to, to understand the, the resistance of pathogens that are in the air. Um, and so why, why we might want to do this, it, it might be for environmental reasons to try and reduce the, uh, the amount of spraying that happens. Um, uh, or it might be, uh, you know, to protect the, the, the lifespan of fungicides, for example, which have a relatively short um, lifespan due to the, um, the evolution of pathogens. Um, or, or as a surveillance uh, system to, to identify new threats that might uh, emerge as, um, as the climate changes, for example. So this was the vision, uh, a sensor uh, sitting in a field, uh, and the sort of the ultimate vision could be a networked uh, set of sensors around the country where we could use weather data, for example, to model the, the um, movement of pathogens or to backtrack them to, to source. So um, we've been working on this since about 2015, um, and, and we've been really working on all the kind of aspects that would uh, would need to go inside um, such a, 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 an automated box that could uh, could go in the field. So this includes uh, sampling from the air, um, the sample preparation, which involves extracting DNA, purifying it, potentially amplifying it uh, because you get very small amounts of DNA out of the air. Um, preparing it for sequencing, carrying out the sequencing, and, and also doing um, bespoke bioinformatics. So uh, I'll talk a, a bit about some of these aspects. So uh, how do we do the air sampling? Um, so you can see on the left here, um, this is a, a photo from, uh, from the Natural History Museum, actually, where we, we were doing a comparison of um, a whole range of different air samplers uh, in, in the gardens they've got um, there. They've got some... Uh, gardens with um, really well-defined um, plants growing um, and some wild areas and some animals as well. So it's a great location to, um, to sample and see what we can pick up. Uh, so we've done this comparison of uh, various, uh, various samplers. Um, the ones we've ended up using the most are these two shown on the right. So in fact, I've got a little video of this one um, so you'll see it in operation. This is called the Coriolis Micro. Um, and it's... Um, I'll just pause the, the sound for a moment. It's a, a sample that captures, it sucks in uh, from this inlet here, it sucks in about 300 liters of air a minute and sort of vortex it round into the, into the water that's in this little uh, funnel here. And then what we can do is take that, um, that, that, uh, that uh, conical um, flask off and we can uh, extract the DNA uh, from that. So you can see here that again, if I play it again, hopefully you can see that. Um, the sort of vortex in the in the water, um, so that's one we we've used for years, and the one we've started using a lot more recently is this one down here. This is um, an, an Innova Prep Cub, it's called, and this has got a, a sort of three hundred and sixty degree inlet at the top. So the other one is a bit more directional. This one's got a flex air in um, all around the top, and again at similar flow rate, uh, sort of 200 and 200, 250 liters of air a minute. In this case, slightly less. 
um, and it collects onto a, a dry filter. So it's slightly different, not into a liquid, but again, we can, uh, we can then extract from that filter. Um, so, uh, so those are the, the air samples we use. So one of the first things we did with AirSeq, once we kind of worked out a, a basic method, was to do some um, tests to uh, test the, the accuracy and, and quantitative ability of, of the approach. Uh, so we use this wind tunnel you can see uh, at the bottom left, and we um, we released uh, Bacillus thuringiensis uh, spores at one end of the wind tunnel, so uh, it, ranging from from uh, no spores, just water, uh, through to 300 million spores. And then at the other end of the tunnel, we set up one of these air collectors, and then we looked at how um, how how much of the Bacillus we could detect. And so this middle uh, this middle image here, this is a, a tree map that's essentially showing the background uh, metagenome, and this is what we detected um, when we uh, just with the control when there was no spores and, and just water released into the air. Um, and really, what what we see here, what you can see here, the, the what the species names means isn't particularly critical. Well, the main thing is that we didn't find any bacillus uh, in the background, which was uh, which was good, um, because then we have on. The, so I've gone too far. Then on the right hand side, we have this image, um, uh, sorry, this plot showing uh, how the, the, the level detected on, on the y-axis compared with the, uh, the number of spores released. And so we see releasing increasing amounts of spores, we observe this quantitative increase um, in, in bacillus in our, in our analysis. So this was great. This gave us confidence that um, we were able to use this uh, to, to quantify uh, what's in the air. And we moved on to do a uh, proof of concept in uh, in crops. So uh, there's a field behind the institute. Um, so this is the Earlham Institute, this silver building here. And then there's a field behind it that's used for crop trials. And at the time we did this, there were um, wheat, barley, and pea uh, being grown in that field. So we set up our sampler in the field and we sampled three times a week in, in duplicate um, for about two months. And uh, first of all, then looking at sort of overall, the overall makeup of the samples, this is what we found. So again, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, another tree map. Uh, and this is showing the composition of all the samples. So when we put all the samples together uh, over those two months, what do, we, what do we see in the air? And so the good news is we see what we might expect to see. So we've got this green uh, region here and these are all essentially insects so insects do get sucked into the air sampler from time to time so we get the dna from those insects um, the blue square down here this represents uh plants um so we 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 suck in pollen for example from plants and other uh, bits of plant material that might be floating around in the air and we get dna from plants and then um, for example, the, uh, this uh, other blue area down here, uh, these are fungi um, and we're particularly interested in, in fungi pathogen, fungal pathogens because these are a big problem for crops. Uh, and then what you can see on the right hand side, you can see uh, again sampling data along the x-axis and then this is showing, uh, heat map showing that um, the sort of high level uh, composition of, um, of, of the air. Um, but again, we these are you know a mixture of bacteria, fungi, uh, plants, and so on. Um, but we were particularly interested in pathogens. Could we detect uh, plant pathogens? And so what we did is we took a database called Phybase, that is a pathogen host interaction database, um, and we um, took all all the uh, wheat, barley, and pea pathogens out of that database, the the reference sequences for them, and we looked in our data to see if we could spot these pathogens and the answer is that we could and so these heat maps again we've got time along the x-axis and the heat map is showing how much of each pathogen we we're able to detect so we were able to detect quite a few pathogens um, mostly at relatively low abundance but some at quite high abundance um, and in the next slide we just have a look <clears throat> in a little bit more detail at some of these so we've just picked out three pathogens here so you can see the top plot is showing um, so the, there'll be another two plots that will appear the top plot is showing uh, the level of that pathogen detected in our sample, and we've got some weather data at the bottom here. Crops were sprayed at the start of the trial, so we have very low levels of all the pathogens. Um, this first pathogen is a pathogen that causes something called yellow rust, and you can see a photo of it, um, of what it looks like on the, on the crop here. 
Um, and and we, we see this in ever increasing levels um, uh, as we sample, and this matches the, the manual uh, observation of the crops that was going on at the time as well, the manual scoring that was being carried out. Uh, the next one is uh, barley powdery mildew and the barley lines being grown were highly susceptible to mildew. So uh, after the initial spraying, we then see this pathogen uh, emerge at, at, at relatively high levels throughout the time we were sampling. Uh, and then finally, this, uh, this is an example from um, uh, a fungal uh, pathogen where we see very low levels of it until we get this peak in the rainfall here, which, which then allows, uh, allows it to take off the changing conditions. Uh, and then we get this, uh, this peak at the end of the period we are monitoring. Uh, so uh, we were pretty happy with um, the early trials of, of uh, air seek for agriculture, and we've continued to work on that. We've got more trials going on at the moment. Um, but I'm gonna talk about uh, a project that came out of that, um, which is still AirSeq, but this was where we transitioned from looking for crop pathogens to human pathogens. And this was with some funding from, uh, from DARPA in the US. And they had a program uh, called Sigma Plus, which was aiming to develop uh, new sensors for uh, biological and chemical uh, terror attacks, essentially. Um, so we had some uh, funding to work on the um, biological attacks. And the idea was to develop um, rapid uh, vehicle-mounted sensors um, for detecting um, bioterrorism within cities. Um, and so we were, as I say, we were part of this uh, successful bid. We were uh, involved with the Natural History Museum, who, as I say, we've worked with on AirSeq um, for, for a number of years. And then also um, this company called Chromec, um, who have a history of, of developing radiation sensors uh, with with DARPA, but prior to this had no uh, bio experience. Um, and, but the idea was that um, AI and the Natural History Museum, we'd work on the science and then Chromec would work on, on automating that to develop this, this old, ultimately this vehicle mounted um, sensor. So we carried out a whole range of research activities um, as part of that project, but I just wanted to highlight um, a couple of things. So one thing we did was to, to go around London and um, build up a, a, a background uh, air microbiome um, in different locations. So we went around to different locations in London. You can see some pictures here of the sampling happening. Um, and that you can see here on this map, the locations we went to. And these little bar graphs are just comparing um, at a high level, things like the DNA concentration or, or the domain level assignments. So that is how, ma how, much, how many viruses versus bacteria versus plants did we find in the air. Uh, and things like the, the overall diversity. Um, so this gave us insights into how the air microbiome varies within cities. Um, we also looked at how it varied over the course of a year. So um, this plot, for example, is showing uh, one site in London and how the air microbiome changes at a very high level between uh, July 2020 and, and July 2021. And perhaps the most obvious thing to, to note here is how uh, you know, again, what, what you might expect really that in, in the springtime, um, this purple dominates and this is, uh, this is plants essentially. Um, so we see a lot more plant material in the air in, in spring. Um, and then uh, other times of the year, for example, we see more fungi in the air. And so you can really see these seasonal variations in, in this plot. Um, so as I say, the, the idea of uh, the idea of the project was that we would develop the science and HM and EI. And then Chromet um, would be automating uh, that for, for this DARPA application. And so uh, that pro process of prototyping is still going on. So we've stopped, uh, we've, we've essentially frozen the science um, earlier on, uh, midway through last year. And then since then, uh, Chromet has been continuing to develop new versions of the, the prototype. So this is what, uh, what it looks like at the moment. Um, but it's a, it's a really complex thing that they're trying to do. And so there's a, there's a lot of work to go on it. Um, what DARPA want, as I say, they want a vehicle mounted sensor, but they want something that can take many samples an hour. So potentially a hundred samples an hour even. And so what we're talking about is a hundred air samples that then have to be processed for their DNA to be extracted and then sequenced um, all as, a vehicle, as this vehicle is moving around the city. So it's incredibly complex um, and Chromec aren't quite there yet um, uh, with, with this prototype, but it's, it's continue, work's continuing. Uh, meanwhile, 
we're interested in um, looking at automation for the agricultural applications. So that was a slight diversion into, into, into the human uh, pathogens and, and automation of that. We're still interested in automating for, for agriculture and the demands for, of agriculture are, are much less than for, the, uh, for these kind of DARPA applications. So uh, whereas for, um, for DARPA, we might want 100 samples an hour for agriculture, one sample a day might be enough to, to monitor crop pathogens. So we've, uh, we've been looking at a number of uh, automation technologies. Uh, one example is, is digital microfluidics. And um, we've been using this device here, the Miraculous Mirror Canvas. Um, and this is a device that contains um, an, elect uh, an array of electrodes um, shown here. And the, uh, droplets are moved around over these uh, electrodes by applying charge. Um, and Essentially, uh, the automation process involves moving droplets around um, around the uh, the electrode array, um, joining them together to mix them, um, moving them over sections. For example, there's these thermal zones where you can move droplets to then get them heated, or magnetic zones. So magnets are quite important in um, uh, in, in molecular biology. Um, there's magnetic beads that are used, for example, in, in DNA purification. Um, and so what you have is this array of electrodes. You have a cartridge that um, is placed on top of it. There's a whole a number of ports on this cartridge for loading reagents into it and for taking reagents off it. And so we've been working to uh, to optimize protocols for this. And this is done with um, uh, with a, a JavaScript interface. So the next slide, you can see there's a, a sort of JavaScript interface here where we can write scripts uh, to control uh, the uh, the movement of um, of the droplets around uh, around the, the device, um, and here I'm just going to play this video uh, in a second. And this is um, a sort of debugging process going on. So normally you can't see what's going on in the cartridge, uh, but we've got these special um, top plates that let us see uh, what's going on and and uh, take a camera, I uh, take a film of what's going on. And you'll see here there's a, a sort of purple line. Hopefully you'll be able to see. And this is a this red is a droplet, and we're going to move this droplet around. And you'll see you'll see how it works when I click play. Um, so hopefully you can see that this droplet is starting to move down this line shown by this red line, and it's going to end up um, at the uh, at the location at the end of the line. Um, so this is just a very short video, just showing this one droplet being moved around, but essentially to automate this process of DNA extraction and preparing the DNA for sequencing. There's a whole bunch of reagents that need to be loaded on and things need to be mixed, things need to be heated, things need to go over the um, magnetic areas. And so another way of looking at that is that the next slide is showing, uh, so we've not got the camera anymore, but this is the readout from the software. And this will show if I press play, you'll see that this is much speeded up, but you'll see, um, Electrodes being highlighted as um, <coughs> as as they are activated and as um, uh, droplets move over them. So here, there's some mixing going on, um, and you, when things move around and around in circles, there's mixing going on. And then you'll see um, droplets moving. There's a droplet just been introduced, and it's now being moved. <coughs> so this is actually sped up about forty times, essentially. So this is going to actually show a whole protocol. Um, <clears throat> which will involve the movement of lots of droplets and lots of mixing and uh, lots of waiting for things to heat up. Uh, I won't leave the whole thing playing, but um, actually it's nearly getting to the end now, but hopefully hopefully you get the idea. So uh, <clears throat> so we've used that in a number of ways. Uh, I won't talk in much detail about this slide. We started off with a very simple, um, uh, just, just using it for what we call library prep. So that's where we've taken, we've extracted the DNA um, but we're now preparing it for sequencing and atta attaching the sequencing adapters. Um, so we tried that first of all, and that worked very well, enabled us to use less of the um, sequencing reagents, so it's cheaper, um, and it frees up um, you know, the expert staff to do other things, essentially. And this next slide, again, I'll, I won't go into too much detail, but essentially it's shown we got very similar results when we did it with the, uh, the automation at, at, uh, very similar results in terms of the, the reads that we get out of the sequencing, but also then what we can do with it when we're, in this case, assembling a genome of Arabidopsis uh, thaliana. So we then went on to something much more complicated where we were then using it for 
for this metagenomic analysis that I've been talking about. So what we do for this is we have this device here, which is, is it's essentially a blender. It uses a process known as bead beating um, to break open um, uh, cells. So you put a, a, a cell mixture in with these beads and then it's it's kind of like a drill, um, a sort of drill head essentially with this uh, which with this um, device attached to the end of it that kind of blends the um, the cells. And then the solution from that is then the input to this um, automation. And then everything else uh, to get that, uh, to get the DNA out of those cells and to prepare them for sequencing is done automatically on the device. And then it can just be loaded straight onto a sequencer. So this worked, uh, this works very well. Um, and um, I won't go into too much details of, uh, about it, but essentially it worked. And then we, we wanted to see how practical it was to take this device uh, outside in the field. So you can see here, this is the Earl Institute. And we literally took it outside to a field uh, in front of the Institute and we set everything up there, uh, powered from, from that the same battery you saw on the end of Chrome up here. Um, and we were able to do everything uh, completely automatically. I say completely automatically. <coughs> um, there's still a couple of manual processes at either end. There's the, the bead beating on one end and then loading it onto the sequencer at the other end. And so we want to in order to realize our dream of having this device in field, we, we need to overcome uh, those limitations as well. And so we are, we're looking at working on that for, for agricultural applications. <coughs> um, and, and we are, we're in the early eight stages of working with an, an engineering company um, to develop um, a simpler form of automation than, than the DARPA project requires, that's, that's better suited to, to the needs of agriculture. Um, I know it's commercial reasons why I can't show you quite where we've got to with that, but just to sort of give you some indications of the kind of technologies that are available beyond that miraculous technology that can take us to that to that final step of of automation. <coughs> excuse, excuse me. There's um there's some examples shown here. So this video is playing um, in the top left is is uh, an OpenTrons platform. So this is an open source. Uh, liquid handling uh, robotics platform. And so essentially this, uh, uh, you can control um, multiple pipette tips essentially to uh, pick up liquids and mix them and um, move them from different, uh, around different parts of the robot. And this is a sort of common technology in, in labs. Um, but one thing you can do is sort of miniaturize these same kind of approaches. And that's what's essentially done in this instrument down here. So this is a new instrument called the, the Tech and Magic Prep. And this carries out the kind of things that we need to carry out for, um, for, our, uh, for our AirSeq. Um, it, this is actually doing it for different kind of sample types and different sequencing platforms, but it's the same kind of thing. And it's doing it by this kind of automated pipetting robot approach that is shown in the, in the bigger robot up here. It's obviously a lot more, it's a lot smaller and a lot more specialized here, um, but it's the same kind of principle. And then another sort of completely different way of doing things is, is to use microfluidics. And um, this is a microfluidic chip shown up here. And essentially this involves um, sending uh, reagents down uh, really small channels on this on this chip. So it's a plastic chip that's etched with um, with these channels, and you can put other components on uh, on the chip, like heaters and magnets and so on, um, and make quite complex um, kind of microfluidic circuits. Really, uh, so that's another approach for doing this kind of automation. <coughs> so uh, I'm going to stop talking about automation. The last thing I'm going to briefly mention um, uh, before I stop is um, just real time analysis. So. Um, it's really important to be able to have rapid analysis for applications like, like AirSeq or for applications like clinical uh, applications where we're doing pathogen detection. So we've been doing work on, on real-time analysis as well. Uh, we have a tool called MARTI, um, Metagenomic Analysis in Real Time. So this involves um, a backend uh, that can run on a laptop or on a high-performance compute configuration. And then it's got this really nice front end developed by, by Ned Peel, who, who was a PhD student and now a, a postdoc in the, in the group. Um, and we use this for all kinds of things. We use this for, for air seek analysis, and we also use it for, um, uh, for example, as I say, we do some work with, with clinical applications from the gut microbiome. We use the same approaches there. 
Um, in your interest, interest of time, I won't talk too much about the functionality, but essentially this video is showing it in action. There's, uh, you can kind of click on samples. They might be samples that have previously been sequenced, or they might be samples that are, that are currently being sequenced. And if if the sequencing is still happening on happening, this this display will will get updated um, as as new sequencing data comes in. Um, so there's various views where you can look at the composition of your sample, find out what organisms are in the sample. Uh, you can look at things like um, anti uh, antimicrobial resistance, um, which can be really critical, for example, in the clinical samples, but also has uh, other applications. And then if I fast forward a bit, you can also compare samples as well. So you can select multiple samples and, and look at how they compare. So this is software we've been developing for a while. It's still under development though, um, but it's uh, it's available if anyone's interested in looking at it a bit more, you can go to this, this website um, where you, can, you can't upload your own data, but you can look at some data sets that we've generated and, and, and see what kind of functionality there is. And then the software is also available to, uh, to download. Uh, I think this is the basically the, the last slide. Um, I won't talk too much about it, but just for infield uh, analysis, we need some kind of infield compute. And the kind of thing we're, we're using at the moment um, if we're not using a laptop are things like this, uh, this NVIDIA Jetson. So this is kind of ideal for nanopore applications um, because it's got, a, it's got a 12 core CPU, but it's got a really powerful uh, GPU in it as well. So the GPU can be used for the, the base calling that's needed for um, nanopore sequencing. Um, and so you can get it as an embedded board or, or we've got this um, developer kit um, that we're using. Um, so uh, I've kind of come to the end of, um, of my, my content. I've just got a one last summary slide though, really, which is just to go summarize what we've kind of talked about. So nanopore sequencing really is enabling uh, completely new ways of working. So we can, we can now take the lab to the sample rather than having to bring the sample into the lab. Automation is really gonna enable a whole range of new sequencing applications and particularly using sequencing as a sensor as we're trying to do with, with AirSeq. Um, and really, uh, Oxford Nanopore have have a, a sort of tagline about sequencing anything, anywhere, and, and essentially we're getting to the point where that, that's that's becoming possible. Real time analysis is really is really important, and there's a lot of applications, particularly things like pathogen detection, where this is going to be really crucial. Um, and there's now these powerful embedded infield compute options like the the NVIDIA systems. Um, but also, you know, things like cloud computing are also important, I think, where, where you've got good internet connections, which is uh, not, not always the case. Um, so that's it. Um, I just want to acknowledge on the last slide all the lots of people that have been involved in the, um, in the projects that I've, that I've talked about. Um, so thanks, thanks to them. And uh, also thanks to you for listening. And I think there's a, a bit of time for questions if people have got them. Yeah, Richard, I don't know. Have you heard about there's this thing called the James Bond effect? And the James Bond effect is a, is the torture you get as a scientist of your manager ringing you up and saying, I saw this technology on James Bond. Why can't you do it? <laughs> but this is the first talk I've seen where it's the other way around. You know, you're you're ahead of James Bond, I think. Uh, <laughs> I was it's a staggering, really. I had no idea that you could get so much detailed analysis in such a small package it's um very it is, surprising it is an amazing technology now for sequencing yeah yeah and i think you know a, a lot of people were were amazed when it when it came out yeah um, and mark hanheider who had to leave early because he's catching a train in in germany wrote pretty much the same thing you know how awesome uh, this is um and his question actually was about how you can roboticize this which you picked up okay later, later in the talk um now there'll probably be some questions but i i can leap in with one that i had immediately which was um i noticed very briefly i could see there was an unclassified branch in one of your mm -hmm. analyses and i was intrigued about how one would deal with novel pathogens which isn't perhaps so interesting in agriculture but maybe it is but obviously in public health one is very interested in that how do you think that would work yeah, no, it's a really good question. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so it's, um, yeah, so essentially most of the analysis techniques rely on 
what we call reference sequences. So the, the genomes having previously been sequenced. Um, and, um, and so, you know, that can be a problem in crop pathogens, for example, where um, sometimes the pathogens aren't as well sequenced. So we, we had an example, we were doing some work, we were applying this air seek in, um, in the, for strawberries in, uh, in greenhouses and, and some of the strawberry pathogens um, weren't available in public collections, uh, the, the, the references. And we, we, we ended up uh, finding someone who, who had recently sequenced a number of strawberry pathogens who was willing to give us their reference sequences. Um, so that's that's one example in crops. But yeah, you mentioned uh, um, sort of completely new things. And the, the thing is, um, generally, they don't tend to be completely new. Um, so they'll, they'll be evolved from something else that already exists. So for things like the clinical applications, a lot of, you know, a lot of the pathogens are, the reference sequences are available. And there's not, you know, there's, you don't get, uh, you don't really get sort of completely new things come along. They're usually related to things we've got. And so the, the kind of techniques that we use for, for classifying uh, the pathogens, you don't have to have exact sequence matches. It can be similar to something else. Um, and, and then you, you maybe won't be able to identify it quite as specifically, but you might be able to say what its genus is. You might not be able to say what its species is. Um, but yeah, no, it's really important to have really good references. And there's, there are, there's not time to go into it. There's all sorts kinds of issues around I bet. your references aren't good enough. Yeah. Um, you know, that's I mean, as, as you massify, these problems will just sort of disappear, one hopes. Yeah. Can I ask, I mean, I can see questions stacking up, but I'm selfishly going to ask my second question. <laughs> but look, um, I noticed on your, um, your air seek uh, outside the back of a John Innes, I think, uh these pathogens were going up and down mm. they had seemed to have an oscillation what was causing them to drop um so it's uh is it is there a self-limit or perhaps on some of these facts i wondered i, I think it's a, it's a good question that there are a lot of variables that we're still kind of trying to unpack so this things like weather makes a difference right um there's um uh, you know it can it can be that the the wind was in a particular direction one day, which meant that we got oh, we, yeah, we picked yeah. it up better. Yeah. Um, or it can mean, you know, uh, well, there wasn't a lot of rain actually on because that's one of the things I highlighted. But you know, rain would make a big difference to it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it you know, it can be uh, it can be that one of the um, one of the experiments sucked in, um, you know, three or four flies, and the flies really dominated. Um, what we what we analyzed at that point so we so at that point we didn't really have a good filter for flies so there were there were some of them where you pick you pick up the you know the um the, the funnel you take that off the end and it would be you know full of flies and then other days it wouldn't be so they you know there are there are challenges to be to be overcome and some some of them since that data was generated some of them we have overcome a bit with that that darpa project for example where we had to sort out a lot of these things um but yeah, there's, it's hard to say for definite which one factor it is because there's quite a lot of factors. I see, yeah, it's still quite early stage tech, isn't it? So, I mean, I can see some questions in the Q&A. Um, should I read them, Schumann, or did you have questions? Uh, yeah, I, actually, I have a question about your... Uh, it's a very interesting uh, product and the topic. Uh, in the past several years, I, I wondered uh, uh, where you got funding to support your work from the UK government or from others? Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, a mixture. So we're a BBSRC funded institute. So that's UK Government Research Council. So um, a lot of the initial research was, was done with that BBSRC funding. Um, and then um, but then also, as a, this DARPA grant, this is U US funding. Um, yeah. So uh, it's been a, a bit of mixture. So we, we, yeah, that was a that was a, a lot of funding we got from DARPA, which was very handy. Um, but bef but the initial research that led to that DARPA grant was the BBSRC. Okay. So. So. Uh, so so uh, have you have you investigated in uh, in, in all the world? Have any other company or the institute, institute uh, they, they have already do a such kind of thing, use the nano, nano pole? Uh, do you know it? Um, so there's, uh, 
so in terms of uh, in terms of the air sequencing, we we know of uh, we know of one or two people. There's, there's, so there's there's quite a lot of, but there there is quite a lot of other sort of um, biological analysis of the air that's gone on. There's not um, there's not as much sort of whole genome sequencing. So what we're doing is sequencing the whole genome. There's a lot of stuff which is based on. Uh, on a different technology that where you look for particular pathogens and you amplify those pathogens. Um, but um, there, there are one or two other groups we're in contact with who, who we have done air sequencing. Um, mostly they're not using nanopore sequencing. We don't know of anyone who's sort of um, trying to do the sort of whole automated nanopore thing. We, yeah. think, that's we think that's relatively unique. Um, yeah, but yeah, uh, but there's people doing all sorts of amazing things with nanopore technology in general, you know, not specifically in air, but there's, um, you know, amazing applications of nanopore sequencing, really interesting uh, applications of sequencing that weren't, you know, previously possible with older technologies. Uh, lots of users of nanopore sequencing around the world, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, I, I got uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, the from audience from... Kun Xiangwen, uh, Xiangwen, uh, he asked how often should the sequen sequence system be cleaned, uh, cleaned before you use next time. Yeah, uh, yeah, and so the uh, so things like the flow cell that the actual sequencing happens on, that's a consumable that you throw away basically. So you buy a new flow cell from Oxford Nanopore, and then you can sequence for two or three days, up to two or three days with it. And then you throw it away, um, essentially, or they or they take it back and they say they recycle it. I don't know if they do, um, but then you know things like the um, uh, the the conical flask that we uh, collect it in into the on the on the air collector. That um, you know that needs to be cleaned after after every capture. It needs to be cleaned really well so that you're not contaminating your next air capture with uh, what was in that. But the actual sequencing device itself, you know, as is disposable uh, consumables. Okay, thank you. I can see there's a question uh, from Rachel. Yeah. Oh, Greg, Greg has got his hand up, but because I'm not in charge of the seminar, I can't promote him. So okay. Greg, can you type your question in the Q&A? Do you mind? Um, and then we can pick it up. Should I read out Rachel's question? It says, she, she Rachel yeah. Trimble says, I'm interested that you are using very customizable technology for the preparation automation. Is this because it is early stage or is it that the required preparation differs for different applications? Um, um, yeah, that, that's a great question. There's, um, so some things are the same for all applications. So, so Things like the what we call the library preparation, which is where you've got you've got your DNA, but you're then preparing it for for sequencing. That's there's you know sort of two or three different forms of that that are the same for whatever application you're doing. And actually, Oxford Nanopore, I didn't have time to mention it. They provided there's a device they have, which is a another digital microfluidics device called Voltrax, and that will do just that library preparation bit um, for any application. Um, but why? What we were interested in is doing everything, not not just that library preparation. And so then the the actual DNA extraction and the stages involved between that and the library preparation they do vary a bit, well, quite a lot by application. So you know, for example, with the air seek where we've got really got really low amounts of DNA, um, uh, there's some particular uh, con constraints with that, and there's diff different depending on what sample type your processing might depend on what DNA extraction strategy you use. So it's easier to get DNA out of certain cell types than others. So, uh, so yeah, so that, that kind of thing has to be a bit more customizable. And, um, you know, we, we obviously want to get to the point where there would be one automation for every kind of air seek application. That's what we want to get to. So that you wouldn't have to tweak it for different, different types of air seek, but you would, if you were, doing different samples if you were doing uh you know if you were doing a clinical application you know if you're sequencing blood or something you have different requirements to sequencing the air i see yeah um and greg i think's joined us so he, he might be able to answer the 
ask the question live. Uh, Richard, I'm not sure if you mean me. I do. Yes, sorry. Okay. Uh, 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 I'm afraid I didn't put up my hand, so I don't know if there was a technical glitch. Oh, never mind. Right. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you did, I, 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 uh, you did put up your hand, but don't worry about it because I have another question waiting here, which okay. Oh, sorry. I'd like to take and so no, no concerns. Uh, and it's from Wenjia Wang, um, who says, "Hi, Richard. He means you. Uh, nice to see you and hear your talk." Very interesting ideas and works done. On AirSeq, what are the smallest particles it can pick up and sequence? Can it identify virus particles? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. And yeah, nice to see you again, Wenja, um, uh, or to hear from you. Um, yeah, we can. Um, so there's, there's two things. So there's DNA viruses and there's RNA viruses. Um, so uh, most of the time we're doing DNA sequencing, so we can pick up, we can pick up DNA viruses. We do, um, we do pick them up sometimes. RNA viruses require a, a slightly different, uh, require a different uh, process to, to sequence the RNA. Um, we have done a bit of that, but it is, it is much harder. Um, it's possible, but it's much harder because um, there's a lot less virus RNA in the air than there is DNA from you know pollen and fungi and so on. So it is a lot more challenging. It's something we are we're sort of working on for for like the DARPA application. That was something we worked on a little bit, um, but it's much harder. So most of, most of the time we're talking about um, DNA. So we're talking about fungi and bacteria and plants. Mostly what is what we're interested in. I, I was expecting in the old time history of London to see big dramatic effects during lockdown and and COVID. But I, I don't think I did. But... No, I, I, I don't think um, so. That was that would have been, uh, that, yeah, that would have been part of it. Would have been through lockdown at least, wouldn't it? But um, but yeah, I mean, most of the things that are dominating um, are unlikely to have been affected by by the lockdown. I think. We... Well, I thought transport might be very significant in moving stuff through the air, but it seems not. Um... Well, I mean, we were we were sampling though in a in a quite a large garden area outside NH, NHM for the for, for that right. graph. So, you know, um, yeah, I think the area is probably large enough that it wouldn't have been influenced by by that kind of movement happening happening outside. And you know, it's going to be dominated by the all the plants that are near to the collector. Right. Um... It was a really fascinating talk, Richard. I mean, I, I was quite staggered by it, actually. And I really hope there's lots of roboticists who are watching this talk live or watch it on catch up. So I really hope that it leads to some collaborations. And you can see what great collaborators the Earlham Institute is. The list of your collaborators was one of the longest I've ever seen. Um, so fingers crossed that we, we can do things together and, uh, you know, we can get our teeth into some of those robotics. That'd be great, um, yeah. Problems And I thought also, um, I have a friend who works in public health, and I'm just going to make a note to send him the, send him a link to this talk, because it's so, in, you know, it's, it's the, you're looking at the future here, and it's very encouraging, very encouraging. Well, thanks very much. That's not, yeah, not so <laughs> thanks for that. It's really good, very enjoyable. Um, and um, let's hope that great things happen. Okay, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Richard. Thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation to, to join you. Thank you.